Cindy Novak, Downsides Administrator with the Carolyn Stark Real Estate Team. Thank you so much for joining us for our Home Edition event. Today, we have a great program for you. Karen Dickrell will be here with Who Gets Grandma's Pie Plate? What about Grandpa's Tools? She does a terrific job with this program, and it's so much fun to hear her weave personal stories into it. Karen is a professor of family development with UW-Madison Extension in Outagamie County. She brings a lot of passion and a wealth of knowledge to the programs and activities she supports right here in our community. We are so grateful for her participation in our program. Now, here's Karen. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Um, a little different because I'm used to being in front of people and seeing your expressions. So I'll have to imagine that as, as we talk about who gets grandma's yellow pie plate. Um, Working for Extension, Ottagamie County and the University of Wisconsin, um, this is not a new topic. And some of you have probably heard it before. I was going through some files, and I found that I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, but over those 20 years, I've, I've learned a lot um, from people and the stories that they've shared, but also my own life um, journey. And so that's what I'm going to share with you today. Who gets grandma's yellow pie plate? Now, this isn't Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate. The program comes from the University of Minnesota, and you can still get their resources online. They have a workbook and a DVD that goes along with it that was updated in 2016. Um, but a lot of the materials are basic. And um, it's really, if you want to call this class in its real terms, it's what do I do with a non-titled property in my life? Well, if we put that out there, I don't think anyone would come to the program because it doesn't sound very exciting. But as soon as you start to talk about grandma's yellow pie plate, then you start to get some feelings and memories and things that really hit home for you. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. And if there are questions that come up as you're watching the video, there'll be contact information of how you can get in touch with me and I can um, put you in touch with other resources. Um, everyone has property to transfer. Some of us have a lot, and some of us have less. Um, but some people consider our property treasures. And others, maybe other relative members, call it trash. Like, why are we keeping this, or what is this for? So it's all a matter of perspective and realizing what's most important to you in the end. And how you want to share your earthly possessions with loved ones, be it family members, neighbors, acquaintances, people that you've met throughout life. So the non-titled property ownership is the owner is not identified with a written document. So it might be things like this bowl. It could be a deck of cards. It could be salt and pepper shakers. Now, for most people, that's what they are. It's a dish, salt and pepper shakers, and cards. Well, you can't really tell that they're cards. There's cards in here, playing cards. But it's all things like it could be tools, it could be furniture, um, dishes, those things that are in the basement stored away, um, closets, cupboards, things that you accumulate and have accumulated. And it might not be just your accumulations. It could be from your mom or your dad or from your grandparents. And so I've got some stories that I'll share along the way today that help to hit home with why who gets grandma's pie plate is important to us as families. So non-titled property includes things, could be guns, it could be tools, furniture, photos, um, books and printed items, dishes, jewelry, and, and other collections that you might have. When my parents um, sold their house, um, my dad, we grew up on a farm, and when they moved to town, the tractor came with him. Well, that was a titled property item. But all the other stuff out of his tool sheds and garages, all those tools came to the new house, and they lived there for over 20 years. 
So when they were selling the house and we were going through everything, we um, cleared out the garage so that we could put everything kind of together because it was all over. He had plus stuff in the workshop in the basement, stuff in the shed that he built, and then some in the garage. So by the time we got done collecting all of his tools, we had enough for seven sets of tools for each of his grandchildren, which was a really neat kind of memory for them to have, that they have a hammer that was grandpa's that he used to use, a screwdriver, different kinds of tools and things. We didn't know there was going to be enough, and actually there were some other things I think that were left over in the end, so some people got a little extra, and some things we just donated. But those are the kinds of things that, over time, it takes time for families to do that. The furniture that you have accumulated. Some things, it's early garage, and it's time to get rid of it. It's broken. It's dilapidated. But some furniture pieces have a history. So during COVID-19, I'm working at a table in my study. I call it my joy room. Um, because that's where I used to keep all my joyful things, and now my office has moved in there. But this table I got from my grandparents, and it was at an auction. And the table <clears throat> was not in the best condition at the auction, but I wanted a table with a drawer, because I thought then I could put some stuff in there, because everybody needs a junk drawer, you know, to put stuff in if you're cleaning off. So I got this table at the auction, and my dad came up to me. We weren't together when I bid on it and got the table. He came up to me later, and he said, can you believe someone paid $40 for the old butchering table? That was in the basement. That's where we butchered the chickens on the farm. And I paused and I said, Dad, how much space is on the truck? <laughs> you bought that? And it's like, well, yeah. I didn't remember that it had been used for butchering chickens, but OK. So um, I took it to a, a man that did really good furniture restoration. He flipped the top of the table and refinished it all, and I think I've had that butchering table now for 30 years, and I've been sitting at it every day in my home office, and it brings back a sense of family to me. Now, other people might say, I don't want a butchering table in my house, and, but it gives, it's also a point of discussion and sharing and history for my nieces and nephews and other family members when they're able to come and visit again. So furniture is important. Um, and looking at photos, um, those are also things that um, are part of what we do. And, um, and that history, again, of knowing what do you have and who's in that picture. And, you know, if you don't have those names, it's like, well, yeah, they wore black for a wedding dress, okay. Well, you can historically look back at some things and maybe on the family tree figure out, oh, that's Aunt Norma, oh, that's Aunt Esther, oh, I think that's Agnes. But those photos are important over time. But not everybody wants those photos or even cares about them. The books and printed items, the dishes. So this dish, um, when I'm in a class with people, I say, okay, how much do you think this is worth? And, and people will, you know, give me... A, give me all kinds of different ideas and things like that. And, and some of them will say, oh, $15. And some will say 99 cents. And some will say, you know, oh, no, $300. Well, I wouldn't have a $300 bowl that I'm walking around with and putting in my trunk. But this represents the Jello bowl from my grandma, who I think she got it as something at a grocery store one time as a freebie thrown in, because they used to give dishes and things like that. But this particular dish I bought at the dollar store. So I paid a dollar for it. But it has memories because whenever the bowl that looked like this was used with Grandma, she would make orange jello with the little mandarin oranges in it. Not strawberry jello with strawberries in it. No, it was the orange bowl jello. And so those memories come back, and, and you, you think about that. And, and for some people, that's really important, and for others, it's not. Jewelry. Um, jewelry is also non-titled. And I remember one participant sharing the story about her uh, mother-in-law passing away, and her brother-in-laws lived on, on the farm, and they kind of just stayed living in the har farm after their mother had passed away. And <clears throat> um, she always kind of wondered, well, I wonder what happened to mom's jewelry. 
But she didn't feel right asking about it right away because she thought, what would the guys do with jewelry? But a couple of years went past, and then she asked them. And she said, you know, Mom had some really pretty jewelry. What, whatever happened to that? Oh, when we cleaned out that drawer, we just threw it in a box and gave it to, you know, I don't know if it was Goodwill or St. Vincent de Paul, but we just gave it away. And she was like, oh, <laughs> that's your family history. Those, and maybe it wasn't worth a lot of money, but it was the memories. So jewelry sometimes is important to people, and sometimes jewelry does have a value. Or it's been passed on from year to year, generation to generation. And then there's sometimes the collections. Um, one woman talked about, it was a collection that her mother-in-law had, and it wasn't cardinals, but it was another, I don't think it was penguins maybe. And her mother had over 200 penguins, statues and pictures, and they were all penguins that she had collected over time. And when she passed on, it's like, what are we going to do with all the penguins? Well, they sold them. They went on eBay and, and sold them. And she said, we did keep a couple of them, but who needs 200 penguins? So again, it's those collectibles and those things that people have that are non-titled, but may have some memories for people. The next um, part of the presentation is talking about letting the stories begin. Well, I already started. Um, one story that I have is about the rocker, and that's from our family. So my grandfather had a rocker that had a wicker base and back, and um, somehow on the farm where we grew up, it eventually ended up out in a shed. And then my dad rescued it and found someone that could reweave the, the wicker seat and back, and he refinished the chair. So when they moved to town, that was his chair that he had in his bedroom um, where they he put all his clothes. <laughs> I don't think he rocked in it much, but it was in Grandma and Grandpa's bedroom. And so when he passed away, the rocker isn't the most sturdy rocker because it's got that, you know, the, the caning and things, and it's just not real sturdy. But it was my grandfather Jacob, and my dad was George, so I call it the Jacob George rocker. And and nobody really had room for it in the family. And the youngest grandson is in college now, but he didn't have room for it, but his name is Jacob George. So I said, okay, well, let's load it in my car and I'm gonna store it until Jacob George graduates and has a place of his own. So the Jacob George um, rocking chair is sitting in my living room ready for him when he gets his first place that he feels comfortable having, having the rocking chair and a little bit of his heritage because he was too young to really gather or get anything from grandma and grandpa. He was still in high school and, and things weren't, you know, he didn't really need anything at that point in his life. So he wanted that to be, I wanted that to be there for him. I hope he wants it. And if he doesn't, then we'll deal with it at that time. But I still call it Jacob George rocking chair. Another family um, talked about a table that they had, and the, the um, wife, the husband had died, and the wife said, yeah, it's a poker table. And she said, it was a folding poker table, and when he passed on, I thought, I'm not hosting any more poker, poker parties, so what am I going to do with it? And she said the poker table reminded her of those poker kinds of games where she was always getting sandwiches or running to get beverages for everybody was, that was participating in the card game. Um, so it was an okay kind of memory, but it wasn't one that she really needed to keep the table for. So she asked the grandchildren, is there anyone that can use a poker table? Or do you know anyone that might want a poker table? Well, three of her grandchildren said, yeah. They were, they were interested. So that was a problem. So she had three people that wanted the poker table. So she kind of thought about, what am I going to do? How are we going to decide who gets which poker table? What do we? So anyway, she came up with that they played a game of poker, and the poker player, game player, took all, took the table home with them. So for her family, there was a little humor with that and a little family time spent together playing poker. And some of them didn't know how to play poker real well yet, but they learned from each other. So it was some of that family strengthening kind of um, enrichment that happened. So the sense of humor is really important because for some people, they get very much involved in some of the things, and others just walk away and don't even want to see 
what's in the household. It's just they hire someone to take care of it and it's gone. In one of my classes a number of years ago, uh, a woman said, so my non-titled stuff is all that stuff you can find in my house and in my basement. Oh my. She went on to say, if I die in my basement, I'd have to die standing up. So that gave you a clue as to how much stuff she is dealing with and what she was thinking of in um, what she had. So that's the non-titled property. So sometimes people have questions about titled things. Well, what, what is titled and what does that include? So that would be things like real estate, your savings and checking accounts, motor vehicles. I remember one, um, one man talking about he had a Cadillac in the back garage that you know, he wasn't sure he wanted to gift to someone. I said, well, that's titled property. So that you have to deal with in a different way. Sometimes it's machinery. So that tractor that dad took to town, they lived in a small town. So he used the tractor to clean the driveway and the sidewalks. And, you know, he was happy he was on his, his uh, tractor. Um, but those things you have to sell. Those you have to take care of the paperwork in the right way so that it's, it's covered. It might be um, chainsaws and different kinds of saws if you have woodworking kinds of things, machinery, stocks and bonds, and yes, the Green Bay Packer tickets too. When I first got this um, information from my friend Christy, she was in Minnesota at the time, and shared it with me. I said, oh, can we change the title of the program from Who Gets Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate to Who Gets Grandma and Grandpa's uh, Packer Tickets? And she said, oh, Karen, you've got a lot to learn. And I said, well, why? <laughs> so for, first of all, Packer Tickets are titled property. And if you work with the Packer Company, uh, the business office, they'll help you figure out how you determine who's going to get your season tickets, if you're lucky enough to have them. So the decisions about both the titled and the non-titled property are important. And what's important is to take the time to talk about it as a family, if the family's interested. Again, that's been changing in those 20 years since I've talked. It used to be that families were really interested in everything. And now the generations are, I don't want that stuff. There's more minimalist. Um, it's like, why would we want that? So not everyone has the same story or perception of items or why it's important or why you'd want to keep it. So one of my perception stories has to do with these salt and pepper shakers. Now, um, if you get a chance to look at these really close, they're not real usable because these are old salt and pepper shakers and you're going to get a lot of pepper coming out of that one. Um, but they have a story. And so when we were cleaning some things out, my sister said, oh, throw them out. Look, they're all corroded. Why would you keep them? And I said, well, these have a memory for me. And I don't know if it'll work here. Yeah, you can kind of see. But when you, they're weighted. And so it bounces. So this was a toothpick holder. So the memory for me was grandma and grandpa live upstairs, we're downstairs, we're on a farm, I'm a little girl, two, three years old. In the morning I go upstairs and have oatmeal with grandma and grandpa, and then I go downstairs and I tell mom and dad everything that mom and dad were talking about that I understood. Maybe I was four years old by then. But anyway, the salt and pepper shakers, I would play with those on the table while grandma was making the oatmeal. And I have that memory. I have the memory of the table, where grandma stood at the stove. I still remember the kitchen. But my sister is, well, she's younger than I am, and she never had that experience, so she had no clue where these came from or what that memory was for me. But, so I kept them. Now, I have to write that story down, and I don't know if anyone in the family even is going to care about it, but I've been able to tell a story about those salt and pepper shakers for a number of years. So they're, they're important to me. Another special meaning, this is just a deck of cards. But it's a deck of cards that my mom and dad got as a wedding present. Now think about the wedding presents people give these days and how much is spent for wedding gifts. This was a wedding gift. But they spent hours and hours of playing cards with them, with their friends. They play sheep head and, um, and then they teach kids different things and they're plastic coated cards. So these are 67 years old, at least. 
So they've got a little bit of a history. And when we found those, it's like, oh, it's just a deck of cards. Who wants them? But um, we used those deck of cards when we were going through my parents' household. And there were five kids, so we had five cards. And the highest card had the first choice of whatever it was we were looking at for that time. Maybe it was the dishes, or maybe it was a set of dishes, or some, some pictures, or whatever it might be. So there's, there's different stories. There's another thing that um, some people, like my nieces, were like, well, what is this? Now, some of you do know what it is, um, but it's pretty special. Um, because this is a special, it's a pencil sharpener, and you can adjust the size by squeezing the top here to a different sized pencil. And that in itself for my niece is like, you had different sized pencils? Weren't they all number twos? No, they weren't. And then this is a little suction cup so that when you have it on a surface, it would stay and stay put. And also my niece said, well, where's the cord to plug it in? because all she knew was an electric pencil sharpener. She had not seen a pencil sharpener like this in her life experiences. So you do have a choice, um, and you can deal with the things that you have in your life and do it now when you're living and give it to the people and, and tell the stories, or you can let it go for others to take care of. And many of the people that have taken the class and have been with me in the workshops I've heard stories, and sometimes they're not the best stories, of how difficult it was to go through everything, or how they finally just hired someone to go through and just load everything up from the house and haul it away and didn't keep any memories. So you have the choice, and it's your stuff. It's your possessions, and you decide what you're going to keep and what you're going to gift and maybe what you're going to sell and who you're going to give it to. So non-title property decisions, the meanings and some things are like, well, this old thing, or what would you do with this? Um, and so their emotions sometimes are involved. There was one woman that shared a story of, um, in her family, her mom had a pitcher and a bowl that always sat on a certain dresser. And when her mom passed away, that was one thing that she really would like to have had. But yet when the family got together, her sister-in-law said, oh, I'll take that. And it was gone before she could say anything that that was really what she wanted. So she let it go. She thought, I've got pictures of it. I can let it go. But as time went on, she was like, I wonder what happened to it. Because when, when I go over to their house, I never see it. Well, maybe it's upstairs, but I'm not going to go upstairs looking for that water pitcher. So she got up her courage one day and asked her sister-in-law, so that water pitcher you got from Mom, and it had that little bowl, what happened to it? And the sister-in-law paused a little bit and she said, oh, that thing. When I got it home, I saw it was cracked, so I just threw it away. So again, it's different meanings for different people. And it's, to this day, the woman said, I just had to let it go because it's gone. I'm never going to get it back. And to get upset about it and have a family rip, it's not worth it. Emotions are awful, often involved in a way that you'd never think about. The Nesco Roaster, a family talked about how they had this Nesco Roaster that everybody used in the family, and they always went to grandma's to get the Nesco Roaster if it was for confirmation or a baptism. or Whenever the family needed that Nesco Roaster, they went to grandma's to get the Nesco Roaster. And when she passed away, it's like, well, we're not going to get rid of the Nesco Roaster because we all use it, but who's going to be the keeper of it? And they couldn't decide what to do with it at first. And this family came up with the solution of, well, the firstborn gets it the first year after mom dies, the secondborn gets it the second year. Somehow they keep track of it, and they know who has, well, mom died three years ago, so okay, this would be, so it's, you know, so-and-so's got the Nesco Roaster. And as they're telling this story, they're, they're really, they're proud of that, because then they also have to go see those other family members, and it just kind of ties them together with, with their mom and the Nesco Roaster. And in my mind, I'm going, okay, you could go to the store and each of you buy a Nesco Roaster. But it's not the same. And the Nesco Roasters that are built today aren't the same. So for that family, it was really important that that's how they dealt with the Nesco Roaster. It's also impossible to divide things fairly because 
you can get an appraisal of everything in the house, and that's what some families have done. But sometimes the monetary value doesn't match the memories and the fact that maybe you'll never be able to replace it. There's also the perception of what is fair. So is it just the immediate children and siblings that get it? Is it the grandchildren? Are the in-laws, outlaws included? What happens when the family system gets more complicated and there's a divorce or there's never been a marriage? But you know, that's when you have to start to think about some of the things that I'll talk about in just a little bit of making sure that if there are some things that you want to go to certain family members that you keep that in mind. And also, when you're doing this, it involves facing issues of death and loss. Some people go through this um, after someone has passed away. And to do it right away, sometimes the family members are out of state, so everybody's in. It's like, OK, we've got two weeks to get this all taken care of. And you're still dealing with the death and the loss of your loved one. And now you're dealing with well, all their possessions. And I know it happens. It's real life. Um, so, but some families, if they start to clean out or if they start to give things away, it's like, oh, I don't want you to die. <laughs> and, and really it's so that they can be there and share with you the value of why something is given to them and why it's important. So um, those kinds of things are sometimes very special. Factors to remember, um, recognize the sensitivity of the issue. And again, the family dynamics and how we get along in our families. Everyone loves everyone and we never have any arguments. Yeah, right. Um, maybe it depends on the time of day or the part of the lifespan where you are and how you relate to other people in your family. But sometimes the strangest things will bring up little sensitive issues. So when my grandmother and their household was broken up, um, it, they had an auction. And um, I really wanted her potato ricer. Now, I use this for other classes. And some people look at me and they go, Karen, what, what is that? I did a program for the sheriff's department. And I took it in. And I'd say half of the guys knew what it was and half of the guys didn't know. And that's where my cousin was. He got it. He got the actual grandma's potato ricer. But he didn't know how to use it, I found out later, because he called someone and said, OK, if you're making the potatoes, do you cook them first and then push them through? Or do you push them through raw? Well, anyone that's made rice potatoes knows you cook them, you put them in, and then you press this down, and you get rice potatoes that come out of it. And I thought, well, good, I'm glad he got it. And I did find my own potato ricer. But it just doesn't work the same, and I haven't used it as much as Grandma did, and it's to get apart, to wash it. Grandma's just fell right out. But I still have the memories of making rice potatoes with Grandma, so it all is not lost. You need to determine what you want to accomplish in that transfer of what you have. So I had one woman in a class that talked about that she was cleaning cupboards and closets and decided that um, she was going to give things to people as they came to visit. And she gave some things to people and then found out that they were giving things away or they weren't even taking it out of the car. They were um, looking at um, stopping at Goodwill or St. Vincent de Paul or giving things to people. And, and she didn't feel comfortable with that because she really wanted them to have that item. But evidently, they didn't want it. So she decided, well, I'm not going to give things away if they're going to not keep it because I wanted them to have it. So she, she decided not to do that anymore. And so as she was cleaning things out, and she didn't have to move right away. As she was cleaning things out, she had a table in the basement that she was putting things on. So if someone did stop in, She'd say, oh, I'm cleaning out some cupboards. I just put some things down on the table in the basement. Go down there. There's some bags. If you want any of it or all of it, just pack it up, and it's yours. She said, all of a sudden, people were coming to visit her more often <laughs> because they wanted um, some of the things that she had. So she found people that really wanted some of those things, and that made her feel better, too. So decide what is fair in context of your family. As I said earlier, who is involved? Sometimes our grandchildren 
may not want things, or they may want things. Another woman talked about some furniture. It was a bed that she had that she thought her son would want. And um, he said, you know, Mom, I've got enough furniture for my house, but my daughter, your granddaughter, I think she could use it. And so that's what they did. So it was kind of given to the son, but then he gifted it to his daughter. So it's, it's deciding what's going to fit, how is it going to go together for your family, and what's going to be fair. Because then she was saying, well, the other grandchildren didn't get a bedroom set. Well, no, but he got it, and then he gave it to his daughter. So it's all how you have the context of it and what you feel is right. Understanding that belongings have different meanings to different people. So that's where my teapot comes into play. A number of years ago, I was in a raffle. I think it was a 4-H raffle. And um, I won the teapot. I won this teapot. Now, I do drink tea every once in a while, so it was kind of neat. Um, and it was in better shape in those days, because this is transported to many, many programs with me. But some of my family members saw that teapot. I had it on a shelf, and they're like, oh, Karen's got a teapot, and she drinks tea. So for my birthday, for Christmas, I started getting teapots. Now, I didn't tell people, oh, I want to start collecting teapots, but they decided it would be good for me to have more teapots to the point where I had to buy a little shelf where all my teapots are now sitting in my guest room, and I dust them off every couple months. Um, I don't use them on a regular basis, and I've got an electric teapot that works and heats up really fast, but I've got some nice-looking teapots. So sometimes you start to collect things over time that, you know, yeah, I like tea, but it wasn't about collecting teapots. But sometimes we do that. One woman, um, actually it was her niece was, was in the class with me, and um, she talked about how her aunt collected angels. And I think she had been a teacher, so she got angels from all kinds of different people, from relatives, um, former students, from neighbors and friends. So she had, a lot, she didn't have penguins, she had angels. So she had a lot of things that she had collected over time. And when she passed away, this woman said she and her sister went to the house to pick out clothes for the burial, and they saw all of those angels, and they went, oh my gosh, what are we going to do with all of these angels that she had? They're beautiful. So they picked out the clothes, and she said, she didn't remember how it came up or how it was decided, but between the two of them, they found some boxes, and they took the angels to the funeral visitation. In those days, you could have real visitation. <laughs> we're, we're very different now with COVID. But um, in those days, people came, and they gave their last respects and, and things. So as people came in and saw the angels, the nieces said, please, pick one or two angels as a memory of our aunt, and take it home. So some people came and found the angels they had gifted their aunt, which was very special, and others just took angels. So in the end, there were very few angels left that they had to decide who to give to. Now, it would have been very hard for them to find all these people three weeks later or four weeks later as they were divvying everything up from their aunt, but they gifted it at the funeral with a special memory for that aunt. Under that title of understand belongings have different meanings to different people, another story from a couple talked about a grandfather clock that they had. And um, they decided that they were going to give it to the oldest in the family because it's only one grandfather clock, so who in the, they had three kids. So they offered it to their son, and he said, oh, thanks, Mom and Dad, but that grandfather clock only reminds me of the times that I didn't make curfew, and you knew it because of that clock. So, no, I don't want the grandfather clock. So they, okay, well, their daughter was next in line and called her up and, you know, your brother doesn't want the grandfather clock. Would you like it? Well, thanks, Mom and Dad, but it's not the style of furniture that I have, and I really don't need a grandfather clock. It doesn't fit my decor. So before they, much time had left, they looked at each other and they went, well, okay, we had three kids. Uh, before they could call the third son, he called them up and he said, I hear you want someone in the family to get the grandfather clock, and that's something I've always wanted. Can I have it? 
So he got it. It went to his family, and he wanted it. And at the end of the story, the husband looked at the wife and he said, I'm sure glad we had three kids because I don't know what we would have done with the grandfather clock otherwise. But, you know, it's those stories again that enrich and bring us together as family members that's so important. Another factor is to consider the distribution options and consequences, and I'll get into that in just a little bit. And the final thing is to agree to manage conflicts um, if they arise. And unfortunately, in some families, that's been a riff that has torn families apart. And they don't even know why they don't talk anymore, other than, what well, was after Grandma died, or if it was Aunt, after Aunt Ethel, or Uncle Fred, or you know, what, whatever it was, um, agree to talk it through and, and use those I messages of, I'm uncomfortable how we dealt with this, or I'd like to revisit it, or is there another way we could deal with it? So there are going to be conflicts, and having that conversation is, is really important. So considering the distribution options, the options to consider, oftentimes when I teach this class, we also have an attorney that's with me, or I'm with him or her, um, and so they give the legal aspects of the titled property and some suggestions of what to do with the non-titled property. And I really do encourage everyone to look at that future and to have a will and to have the legal kinds of aspects taken care of of all the stuff that you have in your life. And oftentimes, the attorneys that I will be teaching with will recommend that you have a list. And with that list is where you list maybe what you would like to go to certain people. What some families have done, and one grandmother did this, she gave a sheet of paper to all of her grandchildren and said, I'd like you to list, if you could have anything in my house, or garage, what are three things that you would like and why you would like them. And she said that really helped her decide, and she knew that that was something that they would like to have, and so it helped her in the decision making. And if two people wanted the same thing, like the poker table, you could play for poker, and winner takes all, but it helped her understand why it was a good memory for them and why they wanted it. So um, creating a list that way, but also in your own, who do you want to get what, and make sure that you date that list. Because sometimes things change. Family dynamics change. People leave or get divorced or marry or remarry or remarry again. Or, you know, there's children and grandchildren and stepchildren and half-brothers and half-sisters. So life goes on and changes. So make sure if you make a new list, that you destroy the other lists that you have, but also the dating is really important because that's going to be important when people need to look back at what, what the timing is of when you were gifting that. Um, gifts are another factor. So um, one example is my own, in my own family. My mom wasn't sure what to give the first granddaughter when she got married, and she was really in a quandary like, oh my gosh, and so I said, well, let's look in your cupboards. And she said, look in my cupboards. I'm not going to give what I've got. And she said, I said, but sometimes there's special memories tied with that. So as we were looking in her china closet cupboard, we found this square cake plat, plate that if you tipped it upside down, the base became a punch bowl. And I remember using that cake plate for special birthdays and, you know, church celebrations of communions and confirmations. And I remembered it growing up. But I didn't remember it being used much when the grandkids came along because by then it was stored in a special place so it wouldn't get broken. Um, so the grandkids didn't have as much of a memory of it. But um, we decided, she decided, that that might be a nice wedding gift, bridal gift to give to her first granddaughter getting married. So we... Um, took that and wrapped it up in a tablecloth that she had so it was secure and put it in a box. And, and then she added a little story to that box of that this was a wedding gift and who she got it from and what it was used for in the family. So that was put in the box with it. And we, a couple weeks go by and then the shower came and we took the box to the shower. 
and it was, there were a lot of people at the shower, and it was like, oh, and my mom, I could tell, was going, is this a good idea or not? But as time goes on, we're finding that she got three popcorn poppers, even though she was registered, and everybody said they had checked it off, that they bought it. Um, and the very last package, and I was going, well, where's the package from mom? The very last package that they brought out, and I don't know why or who in their wisdom did it, was the cake plate. And when people realized what it was, there were tears. And it was a special gift that I think will be remembered for a long time that, yeah, you can always use three popcorn poppers maybe. I mean, you can take them back. But the memories and the family history and tradition and coming from grandma, and she also did a recipe book of her favorite recipes. Those things you can't buy any place. So those are the memories that are important. Promises. Be careful with promises because you may promise to someone and then you forget that you promised it to the other person. And so people may say, well, Grandma promised me that I would get this. And then, no, Grandma said I would get it. Or Grandpa said I could have those tools. No, Grandpa said I could. So promises are, are difficult if you don't have it in writing. Now, if you've got that list and it's on the list, you're going to have more of a secure kind of... Um, idea that, that it, that's okay and you've got the list and you've got the promise. Some people will label things with tape and on the back of a chair or underneath a table there's a name and it says this goes to Karen or whoever it might be and that's okay but you know those labels can be taken off and replaced and if you don't have it on the list you don't have that checks and balances. So labeling things is kind of okay, but you really need to put that in writing if at all possible, if it's, if it's something that's very valuable. You can have a private auction, so you could have it with just family members or people by invitation of who you want to invite to that private auction. Or you can make it real public and have a garage sale and a yard sale. Um, there's also the estate sales, and you have someone come in, and they price things, and people come in, and, and they, they purchase the items. Another um, way is pilfering, which is another word for stealing. <laughs> um, one family talked about how um, the couple that had lived in the house were in a nursing home and probably were not going to come home again, so they were starting to clean the house out, and go through things and they stopped at the house to pick up some clothes because there's a change of season and wanted different clothing. And there was a relative with um, a pickup truck backed up to the garage putting all the garden equipment onto their truck. And it was like, oh, did we talk about the garden equipment that you were going to get it all? And it's like, well, they would want us to have it. And it was like, oh, really? Well, the rototiller isn't theirs. We brought it and we rototilled their garden last year and we just didn't bring it back to our house. So it's really not theirs to give to you. So, you know, it's sometimes as relatives, sometimes it may be caregivers. It may be people that you trust that are coming into the home and unfortunately um, may take something. When my mom was in assisted living, she had some jewelry with her that was really important to her but it went missing and we never did find it. Um, we reported it, but it's gone. Never to be replaced, just the memories. Some families have a silent auction where they, people walk through the um, house or the apartment and they write down what they would like and what they would bid. Some people use Monopoly money or play money and um, they bid on things so you may pay $20 for a refrigerator or a stove or something like that. And, and then the whole family member, maybe you're all given $200 of play money, so you decide you know, what you're going to use to purchase. Some things we need to throw away. There's no doubt about it. Um, sometimes you need to rent a dumpster and just get rid of things. I had a friend that was moving, and um, she had 10 bags of gar garbage bags of pantyhose. Now we don't wear a lot of pantyhose anymore so this is dating me but 10 bags and it's like do you really need 10 bags of pantyhose? Well I use them for crafts and the, but you're moving. Do you really need to move 10 bags of, of pantyhose? You know so she made her decision it was one bag. 
So sometimes we have to throw things away or repurpose them. Um, we can recycle. Um, we can reuse. Um, you can give to your church. Or for some people, they just set it out on the curb and miraculously the next morning it's gone. I had some um, lawn chairs that didn't fit what I was using them for anymore. I got some different ones. And so I just set them out at the curb thinking, well, if someone wants them, they're in okay shape. They're not perfect. So I set them out there, and um, it was mid-afternoon. And after supper, I looked, and the chairs were still there. But there was a car, and they were looking at them, and they were sitting in the chairs. I thought, well, yeah, good. If you can take them, great. But I thought, how are they going to fit them in the car? Because it was just a little car, but it had a sunroof. So they put it up through the sunroof in the car. It, somehow it worked. So my, my chairs went, and, you know, it was, it was good because I didn't have to worry about it. So sometimes there's things that you may have to hire someone to take things that nobody else wants, and it may cost money. But there are services that are available out there for you um, to check that out. So there's all kinds of different distribution options that we have and to think about what is some possible things with the items that you have in your family. So finally, it is good stuff. I mean, what are you going to do with all of it? Um, how are you going to use it? Where is it going to go? Um, and just to think about that, and I thought I put, yep, I have a little story, little story that I'll end with about stuff. So you need to get started. All the stuff was not collected in one day. So you need to start small and think about your collections. And it, or do you want to gift it? Um, if you get a pie, you don't eat the whole pie. Hopefully you don't eat the whole pie. You eat it one slice at a time. So you start maybe room by room or drawer by drawer. But think about the stuff that you have. So this is a story I've had for a number of years, and it's called Stuff. Every fall I start stirring in my stuff. There's closet stuff, drawer stuff, attic stuff, and basement stuff. I separate the good stuff from the bad stuff. And then I stuff the bad stuff anywhere the stuff is not too crowded until I decide if I'll need the bad stuff. When the Lord calls me home, my children will want the good stuff. But the bad stuff, stuffed wherever there's room among all the other stuff, will be stuffed in bags and taken to the dump or landfill where all the other people's stuff has been taken. Whenever we have company, they always bring bags and bags of stuff. When I visit my son, he always moves his stuff so I'll have room for my stuff. My daughter-in-law always clears a drawer for her stuff, so I'll have room for my stuff. Their stuff, my stuff, it would be so much easier to use their stuff and leave my stuff at home with the rest of my stuff. This fall, I had an extra closet built so I'd have a place for all the stuff too good to throw away and too bad to keep with my good stuff. You may not have this problem, but I seem to spend a lot of time with stuff. Food stuff, cleaning stuff, medicine stuff, clothes stuff, and outside stuff. Whatever would life be like if we didn't have all this stuff? Now there's all that stuff we use to make us smell better than we do. There's the stuff to make our hair look good, stuff to make us look younger, stuff to make us look healthier, stuff to hold us in, stuff to fill us out. There's stuff to read and stuff to play with, stuff to entertain us, and stuff to eat. We stuff ourselves with the food stuff. Well, our lives are filled with stuff. Good stuff, bad stuff, little stuff, big stuff, useful stuff, junky stuff, everyone's stuff. Now, when we leave all our stuff and go to heaven, whatever happens to our stuff won't matter. We'll still have the good stuff God has prepared for us in heaven. So good luck with your stuff. Think about the concepts that we talked about and what's important to you and what you want to leave as your legacy to your family. So thank you so much. I wish you well. Know that Extension in Outagamie County is here. Um, and you've got our, our email, and you can just email or call me. And um, if you have questions, I would be very happy to talk to you. So have a great day, and good luck with all your stuff. Thank you, Karen. That was awesome. Hi, I'm Carolyn Stark, the leader of the Carolyn Stark Real Estate Team. We appreciate you joining us for our Home Edition event. 
We are grateful to our community partners for adapting with us to make the changes needed during this time. Be sure to look for additional monthly programming on topics of interest to our senior community. They include dementia awareness, downsizing and what to do with all of that stuff, estate planning, and so much more. See you next time.